In many countries around the world, people with HIV are being held criminally liable for HIV prevention. Despite strong recommendations against this overly broad use of the criminal law by UNAIDS and the Global Commission on HIV and the Law, new laws continue to be proposed and enacted and more prosecutions are taking place than ever before. But as the evidence stacks up, the verdict seems clear. A criminal justice approach to HIV prevention is hurting the public health goal of reducing new HIV infections. Earlier this year, the HIV Justice Network flew to Toronto to take part in an international meeting on HIV prevention and criminal law. This three-day workshop was a unique opportunity to meet all of the social scientists who have undertaken research on the public health impact of HIV criminalisation, one of whom is Laurel Sprague, who teaches at the Department of Political Science at Eastern Michigan University. I sat down with Laurel to hear what she thought of the meeting. It was incredibly valuable because it brought together researchers who are working in different disciplines looking at HIV criminalization and the effects of that. I, I think we looked at a deeper level of the effects of the law on the HIV epidemic than I have seen happen until now. I think individually researchers have been, have been looking more deeply and bringing this group together allowed us to, to get a better picture of what's happening. What are the harms that are happening at the level of public health? What are the harms that are happening at the level of nursing? You know, what are the multiple ways in which people who are at risk for HIV or living with HIV are being affected by the HIV criminal law. So it's happening when, 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 it, when we get care through our nurses and our doctors. That's something we haven't really thought about before or haven't, haven't talked about openly. You know, it's happening when we go to public health. It's happening when we go to get tested. It's happening at clinics. Um, it's happening at AIDS service organizations. There are multiple levels at which the existence of the criminal law trickles down and impacts the kind of care and the kind of support that people living with HIV they are able to receive. It's no coincidence that the workshop took place in Canada, which has seen a sharp increase in the number and severity of charges for HIV non-disclosure since the Supreme Court first ruled on the matter in 1998. A second Supreme Court ruling in October 2012 was a unique opportunity for the court to re-examine the unintended negative public health impact of the law something which had been studied and documented extensively in Canada between the two rulings. Richard Elliott, the Executive Director of the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network, was an intervener in both rulings. Both times that the Supreme Court has pronounced on this issue in Canada uh, in any detail, they have done the same thing. They have on the one hand dismissed concerns that, that various interveners have raised about the negative public health impact of overly broad use of the criminal law on the basis that, in the court's view, there was little evidence uh, to support those concerns. While at the same time, with an equal absence of evidence, uh, accepted quite uncritically the proposition by those advocating for the application of the criminal law and a broad application of the criminal law that it will deter people from uh, engaging in behavior that uh, puts other people at risk of infection. The most commonly cited rationale of the criminal law is to deter morally unacceptable behavior through fear of punishment. Scott Burris and Zita Lazzarini were the first to explore whether HIV criminalization laws had the impact that the lawmakers intended. So Zita Lazzarini and I and some other colleagues got together and made an application and got funded. And that allowed us to go out and do, you know, what, you know, for better or for worse, has, has remained one of the, you know, the main studies in this area. What we found, um, you know, I, I, it makes it sound like I knew the answer to begin with, but it sort of confirmed
um, what I had suspected, that we just couldn't find much of a connection between people's behavior one way or another and the law. We tried to do a scientifically rigorous study. So we had um, almost 500 subjects. We had about equal, about 250 in New York and in Illinois. So New York was a state without an HIV specific law, but had had some high level um, prosecutions for reckless endangerment. And Illinois was a state that also had prosecutions, but it had an HIV specific law. And we, we really found that whether you lived in a state with a law or without a law had absolutely no effect. So that speaks to people's lack of awareness of the laws perhaps, or it speaks to the lack of effect of the laws. But then we also wanted to know, you know, assuming the law in your state is this, uh, this would have what effect on you? This would make, and we found that, uh, again, if you believed you had a law in your state that prohibited exposure without disclosure, um, it also didn't have an effect. We found the same lack of effect for whether you would have protected sex, more protected sex or not. So would your next sex act, you know, would you use protection on that? The one thing we did find was that what people thought was the right thing to do did guide, not what they thought was a law, but what they thought was the right thing to do did tend to guide what they did. Criminal law is generally a, a very blunt tool anyway. Um, and you know, if you think about it, punishment and fear rarely brings out the best in people when they're making individual behavior decisions. And certainly when it comes to sex, criminal law has a very limited record of getting people to change their behavior. Um, so of course it's this Carol Gallatly has added much to the body of evidence on the impact of laws that criminalize HIV non-disclosure. Working with a number of colleagues, she published a series of studies examining whether or not these laws are having the impact they were intended to have. We thought of every single way these laws could possibly be effective. So it was like, okay, do, they, do individuals who know about these laws reduce number of sex partners? Do they, um, these are people who are positive, do they choose only positive sex partners more than people who don't know about the law? Do they, um, are they abstinent more? Um, do they practice safer sex more? Do they engage in oral sex or less risky activities? So we looked at all these things and the data just stacked up that none of them, there were no significant differences. And the only, there were actually only two really significant things one of which was the um, strongest predictor of disclosure was actually comfort with disclosure. So um, what I concluded was if you really want people to disclose, then what you should probably do is increase their comfort, do interventions, do whatever, and don't do laws that could jeopardize people disclosing. Most laws and prosecutions focus on disclosure. In other words, whether or not the person with diagnosed HIV told their sexual partner before having sex. Whilst this may be the right thing to do, does this actually benefit HIV prevention? Eric Michalowski organized the workshop precisely because his own research found that criminalizing HIV non-disclosure was having the opposite effect of what was intended. We see how significant now disclosure or questions around disclosure are within HIV prevention counseling to the point that like there it's too much of a focus. And, you know, I think Barry Adam and others have, have emphasized repeatedly that disclosure uh, is not a effective HIV prevention mechanism and yet what seems to have happened is that the criminal criminalization of HIV non-disclosure has uh, place disclosure at the center of people's concerns around HIV prevention. Um, and that is, a, a, I think, a serious a challenge for uh, people who are enlisted with the responsibility of trying to ensure that HIV, is, is, uh, that HIV transmission is, is uh, lessened. Disclosure has become a, a bit of um, a red herring, I think, in terms of HIV prevention because HIV prevention can and has for a long time happened without disclosure anyways. To require disclosure doesn't necessarily help 
Sometimes it could even hinder the process by creating a false sense of security among those who think that uh, if disclosure doesn't happen, that their partner is negative. The social science evidence shows that when people often get into dis the disclosure area, it's in order to give themselves permission to have unprotected sex. People actually do have to know what their HIV status is in order to disclose it. And uh, there's a good deal of science these days that suggests that it's people who don't know who are newly infected who are actually doing a lot of the infection. And I think one of the things that we're hearing increasingly uh, is from public health practitioners who are starting to say that from their perspective, as people who are working to protect public health, the, the unwarranted overextension of the criminal law is in fact complicating their practice as public health professionals. I interviewed um, a number of uh, providers and, and uh, nurses working in the field doing HIV prevention, and from that it was clear that you know, the criminal law was really having a negative impact on HIV counseling relationships. What, we've, what we have seen is that in HIV counseling, which is really a primary place where HIV prevention work occurs, that the criminal law has, uh, has d decreased the amount of discussion that can occur. I uh, interviewed a number of Ontario public health nurses and, a and asked them, you know, how, how is criminalization, and in particular the, the, the um, requirement to discuss issues of disclosure with your clients, how is that impacting your work? How is that affecting the nurse-client relationship? And in particular, I looked at post-test counseling. And my question was whether or not criminalization has complicated that, and I found that it has. One of the main findings I found is that nurses have to be very careful to, to manage that relationship, and that oftentimes they're finding that clients shut down, that they become very um, uh, unwilling to talk, to speak openly about their sexual behavior, risk behavior, about their contacts. They don't want to share contact information because they don't want people to find out, or they're worried that it might come back. Uh, if, if they're later charged with non-disclosure, then that information has been documented. And so it makes nurses work more difficult. And presumably that can impact HIV prevention if you know, public health relies on contact tracing to be able to do quite a bit of their prevention work. So I'm looking at this in Canada and the United States, and um, you know, in spite of the fact that there are really, really different approaches to public health in the jurisdictions that I'm looking at, um, we do, I think, see some similar effects in terms of um, the anxiety that uh, a number of providers are feeling about, you know, the issue of criminalization as they counsel patients with respect to disclosure. And so how do you think that anxiety is actually having um, an impact on, on public health? Um, I think it's having, in a lot of respects, um, some negative consequences for HIV prevention and possibly for public health more generally. Um, I'm really worried about the system level effects of HIV criminalization. Um, I think in addition to um, having the kinds of effects that um, you know we're starting to learn about in terms of stigma, um, in terms of creating a kind of chill around um, disclosure, um, there's a risk of the overcoding of the public health system by the criminal justice system, if I can use that term. Um, so, what's, so what's happening basically when information that is collected initially um, to facilitate epidemiological research, to facilitate biomedical research, goes into the criminal justice system? It's overcoded, it's repurposed for um, criminal justice reasons. And you know, you have to start wondering about um, the trust that people put in that information, uh, those information uh, systems. You have to start wondering about whether people will continue to um, put, put their trust in those systems. These studies by Eric, Chris and Martin have all uncovered an unanticipated negative impact of HIV criminalization on the healthcare workers who test and treat people with HIV. They found that the criminal law is creating a chill, closing down discussions about HIV on both sides. Trevor Hoppe found another, more sinister impact on healthcare workers. During his PhD research, he discovered that some health officials in Michigan's public health system
appeared to be invested in prosecuting people with HIV for not disclosing their status, resulting in some potentially problematic outcomes for HIV prevention. Health officials were using uh, contact tracing, or partner services as some people might know it, uh, alongside the HIV names reporting uh, system, information system, and basically what that means is that if I come in and I test positive for HIV, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, in some jurisdictions in Michigan, they'll ask me, obviously, who did I have sex with? And then they'll also ask me, did any of those people disclose to you that they were HIV positive? And I'll say, uh, for example, no, no, no one told me. In those jurisdictions, what they'll do is they'll then call the state and they'll ask the state if they have a record of anyone that I named as a partner as being HIV positive. And if the state says, yes, we have a record on John, for instance, being HIV positive, uh, they would launch an investigation at the county level to uh, ascertain if this person is a health threat. So that's one mechanism through which they're trying to identify uh, potential offenders under the health threat statute. And so you also found that there seemed to be some link between that law, that civil law, and Michigan's disclosure law. It was clear that many health officials in Michigan were invested in potentially criminally prosecuting their clients. And that's something that I don't think, um, I don't think we knew before that. I think some people had a sense, uh, but um, uh, it was, I think the first piece of evidence that, that some health departments may be playing a role in facilitating criminal prosecutions. I can understand why people living in some of these communities would have, would think twice about, before talking to health officials about their lives openly and honestly, given what they report, health officials reported to me. One of the most worrying aspects of HIV criminalization is the additional disincentive it plays in a person's willingness to take an HIV test. As Barry Adam has already mentioned, many studies have found that a significant number of new infections come from people who are undiagnosed. But testing isn't just about knowing your HIV status so you can modify your behavior. It's also the gateway to accessing HIV treatment and care. Guidelines from the World Health Organization now highlight that HIV treatment works not only to keep people alive and well for a lifetime, but also prevents new infections by reducing HIV to undetectable levels. Where there is no virus, there can be no transmission. Since treatment is also prevention, then not testing or accessing treatment hurts not only the individual, but also the communities in which they live, harming the broader public health. Globally, we have this huge challenge that we know that there are people who are HIV positive who are not getting tested. And if they're not getting tested, they don't know their HIV status. They um, don't know then that they may need to use precautions when being sexually intimate with other people. And they're not getting access to treatment, which will keep themselves alive. And so, so globally, there has been this concern. And, and it's also been a concern specifically in the United States that we figure out what are the barriers um, for people not getting tested and then not accessing treatment. So we ask a question in our survey. We ask people whether they thought it was uh, not reasonable, somewhat reasonable, or very reasonable to avoid getting an HIV test or to avoid accessing treatment um, if someone tested positive because of HIV criminalization. And those numbers should be zero. We shouldn't have legal reasons for people not to get tested. We shouldn't have a legal reason for people not to access care. And half of our respondents said that um, it was reasonable to avoid HIV testing because of HIV criminalization. And let me see, 42% of our respondents said it was reasonable, somewhat or very reasonable, to avoid getting HIV care, getting treatment once you've tested positive. And to me, that was stunning. It was, it's, it's stunning and, and really highlights for us the real harms for people's lives that are created when we put in these laws, and I think people probably created these HIV criminalization laws with good intentions, but instead what we've got are these perverse consequences in which people are less likely to even be able to do the things that would allow them to stay alive. Patrick O'Byrne's studies have pulled together all of these previous findings and show just how overly broad HIV criminalization is hurting public health. My introduction into 
uh, HIV criminalization, the prosecutions uh, for non-disclosure really came from my personal clinical practice as a nurse. And I thought this, this was very problematic in a variety of different ways. Right? I can see in my own sort of anecdotal experience where we have patients who don't want to talk to me. Uh, then I have documentation being taken away and I said, in addition to my clinical work, my main job as a professor at the University of Ottawa is that I can use my resources, my training, everything there to start looking at this, right? this health issue, this clinical practice issue. Uh, this one I thought was a human rights issue as well. So I really started doing the research aspect. Is that well saying? Is it just my specific right, isolated cases? Is this more widespread? What kind of health issues is this going to have? Uh, what kind of nursing, medicine, healthcare issues, public health issues uh, would this have? So that's really how I sort of entered in to this area of looking at HIV criminalization from the individual clinician, trying to provide the best care for my patients and feeling that these laws were impeding my abilities to do so. What I want to know, particularly in public health and clinical practices, those individuals, no matter how small they are, and mine was about 15 to 20 percent, said that either the prosecutions affect their willingness to get tested or they affect their sort of candor with health professionals. So what I really wanted to know was, the sexual practices of this one in five people, how, do that, how does that compare right, to the other 80%? What about the testing practices, right? So unsurprisingly, you have lower rates of testing, you have higher numbers of sexual partners, you have more unprotected sexual contacts. You actually have, yes, it's a small number of people, uh, but it's people who are actually engaging in right, the practices where you're most likely to have HIV transmission. Really compounding this, however, were the qualitative interviews. We did 27 qualitative interviews as well. Guys were negative, guys were positive. And a resounding theme was nobody could make a distinction between the public health department and the police. It was a single institution. And this is problematic, right? How can you provide healthcare services when people think that you are a police agency? And they would say, I didn't want, I regret doing testing right, with a public health nurse, now knowing that right, they would hand it over to the police if they found out I was Right? not disclosing my status. How do you provide care when people won't access it? Right? So the people who are supposed to be there to do HIV pre prevention can't. They, they absolutely cannot because you can't provide services to people who aren't in clinics. And if they're not in clinics, then right, what are the health professionals supposed to do? Absolutely nothing. Like the laws have effectively rendered your HIV prevention health professionals Right, useless. How can it not have an impact on people and their decision as to whether or not to find out their HIV status if you risk becoming a criminal? It may not at the end of the day dissuade a large number of people, but I think it does dissuade a significant number of people. And it probably, based on the evidence we have, dissuades some of those who are most likely to actually benefit from learning their HIV status uh, and all of the potential benefits to them and others that may flow from that. So why would we want to create an additional barrier? And why would we want to create a barrier to people actually seeking help from the helping professions? Because if we conscript those helping professions to basically become agents of law enforcement, that undermines their ability to help people and that actually undermines the health of all of us. It's not just about um, individuals. I think that when the case, the court hears uh, cases, it's you know about individual acts and you know the activities uh, that individual acts is alleged to have engaged in. But you know the court needs to think bigger and recognize that these individual cases are linked to system level effects that are, I think, jeopardizing um, HIV prevention uh, and the well-being of people and communities. Early in the AIDS epidemic, lawmakers were understandably puzzled with how to reduce and fight the epidemic. Um, they went for some things that were very good and for other things that were, were unproven. That there's no, there was no evidence at the time the criminalization would help reduce the number of people with HIV or help the individuals with HIV. And there's been no evidence produced since that these laws have a beneficial effect on reducing spread of the virus, um, reducing transmission, um, and there's been a substantial evidence of the harms that they cause to individuals. HIV criminalization 
creates a situation in which people living with HIV are considered completely responsible for whether or not HIV is transmitted, and it contradicts all of our public health messages that say you must be responsible for yourself and you must protect yourself. And I think this is particularly dangerous for women who are then, the, the idea for women is that if you trust your partners, you'll never get HIV, you'll, not, you'll never be infected with HIV. Someone who has HIV will let you know. Um, and instead, what we need to be doing is creating environments in which young women can protect themselves. So the existence of the law, I think, creates a false sense of security, tells people that HIV is not a problem that affects them. And that um, if someone has HIV, they will know, and that all they need to do is then avoid those people, when in reality, um, the situation is that people who know their HIV status are the most likely to be um, protecting um, other, their, their, their sexual partners from HIV infection. Everything we know uh, from science and, and from practice tells us that uh, making laws to tell people how to have sex isn't really very effective in influencing how they have sex. It certainly won't stop the HIV epidemic or even slow it down in any meaningful way. So then the question becomes, what else are we getting? I think we, we tell ourselves a lie about what it takes to be a safe sexual community. Um, the lie that somehow we can just assume that those people who are infected will protect us. First of all, a bunch of them don't even know they're infected. And then secondly, you know, even if they do their best, we know that confusion, misperception, and human weakness is going to get in the way. Criminalization is therefore a kind of um, charade uh, about how everything can be sort of managed and organized and you know charades are not good for grown-ups you know we should try and face the facts uh, and do with our limited resources uh, and our limited attention um, what we can to focus on things that matter. Understanding the impact of HIV criminalization on public health is critical to making informed policy decisions. Criminalization is a divisive issue, with strong opinions often informed by morality and a desire to achieve justice by punishing perceived wrongdoing. But can we really achieve justice if such laws and prosecutions are actually doing more harm than good?